Good morning. Welcome to Washington Memorial Chapel on this, the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. A very special welcome to those who are visiting with us for the first time today. Please be sure to fill out the QR code on the bulletin or fill out a visitor's card located in the pocket of the pew in front of you so that we can keep you up to date on what all is happening here at the chapel. In the Episcopal Church, all baptized Christians are welcome to receive Holy Communion and instructions for how to receive are in the bulletin. If you do not wish to receive the sacrament, we still invite you to come up to the altar to receive a blessing. Simply cross your hands over your chest and the priest will bless you because you have blessed us with your presence here today. Just a reminder not to show up here tomorrow or Tuesday because the campus, the entire campus, is going to be closed for a film production. So we'll find out more about that later, I'm sure. But please show up on Thursday at 6 p.m. in the Bishop White Library to listen to Dr. Shirley L. Green's presentation on discovering the Frank Brothers, freeborn men of color, soldiers of independence. Her ancestors are the Frank Brothers, and they were here at Valley Forge. So please be sure to join us for that event. <clears throat> We're also happy to announce that we are now the charter organization for a Cub Scout pack. Yes, it meets here at the chapel every Wednesday at 7 p.m. There are currently over 40 children and their parents involved. So if you are interested or you know a family who is interested, please be sure to stop by on Wednesdays at 7. The cabin shop is looking for Saturday and Sunday afternoon volunteers, and please be sure to reach out to the cabin shop manager, Candace Bagic, um, either via email or in person if you are interested. It is that time of the year to discern how the Lord is calling you to support the mission and ministries of Washington Memorial Chapel for the coming 2025 calendar year. Please click on the button in Friday's news as it reveals our theme and special focus for 2025. Also, we have begun a Burke Legacy Society, which is for anyone who includes Washington Memorial Chapel or the Washington Memorial Heritage in your estate plans or your will. Members of the Burke Legacy Society will be participating in special communications and events. If you have questions about that, please be sure to see Eric Sharp, our accounting warden. The Diocesan Convention for the Diocese of Pennsylvania was held yesterday at the Cathedral in Philadelphia. It was attended by Father Tim, Julia Sharp, and John Wallace. Um, a special note of privilege, there was a, um, a vote for the secretary of the diocesan convention and John Wallace was unanimously elected to that position. I'm sorry, it's mom's privilege. So let's see. If you are not receiving the Friday newsletter, please be sure to see the address at the bottom of the last page of the bulletin to subscribe. And there is coffee hour today with lots of yummies over in the Lafayette room, so please be sure to join us. And we have openings for volunteers for coffee hour in November. So, hey, it's a great month to, you know, Get your bacon skills on here, people. So please be sure to sign up. Now, having done all of that, let us take a moment to prepare ourselves to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness.
in our prayers for the states this morning. Today, we remember and give thanks for Oklahoma, the 46th state admitted to the Union. Let us pray. River red and soil and native brother before us, tawny is thy canvas, creator God, whereon by touch of light thou hast daubed the blue stem grass, rich black earth, and the white-tailed flash of deer. Grant that they who sojourn in Oklahoma's land may deserve thy rainbowed blessing, gilding the arch of heaven and fish below and every creature in his special mode of life. Thine the painting, Lord, ours to pursue thy beauty and truth in the various errands of our common cause. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Glory be to God on high. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, everlasting God, who in Christ has revealed thy glory among the nations, preserve the works of thy mercy, that thy church throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in the confession of thy name. Through the same Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first lesson is from the book of Isaiah. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When he makes himself an offering for sin, 
he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the fruit of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. The epistle is from the letter to the Hebrews. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is bound to offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And one does not take the honor upon himself, but he is called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, Thou art my son. Today I have begotten thee. As he says also in another place, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and he was heard for his godly fear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord.
In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Please be seated. Let me get my notes in order. It's, uh, it was a long day yesterday. It was diocesan convention, which is always, uh, not always my favorite thing to go to. It's, uh, it's not like a root canal, but it's not my favorite thing <laughs> to go to. But I, but I enjoyed it. I enjoy seeing my friends, and I enjoyed hearing news from the diocese. Well, today we have a passage that's known as the request of James and John. And it comes right after Jesus has said these words, or where the gospel says these words. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus began to tell them again for the third time what was going to happen to him. That the Son of Man will be delivered into the hands of chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death. And then Jesus goes on to describe in some detail what will happen. He will be mocked, spat upon. He will drag his own cross up the hill and there be crucified, the worst and most dastardly death imaginable. And then in a moment of breathtaking tone deafness, James and John say, and we want you to do whatever, you, whatever we ask of you. They want to sit at his right hand and his left when they come into his glory. Now, in many ways, this is a very straightforward narrative. It only has three parts. There's the outrageous request of James and John, then there's the angry reaction of the other apostles, and then finally Jesus says, don't be like the Gentiles who lord it over them. And so it should be a very simple sermon, only about two or three minutes. Sadly for you, however, <laughs> what seems to be a very straightforward and simple narrative actually, like most of the parables, has hidden depths. And at least you have to spend a few minutes to look at those hidden depths. And the first thing we have to do is put it in context. Why in the world do James and John say such an outrageous thing to Jesus? Well, part of the answer lies in the history of Israel. Now in the golden days, when David and Solomon were the kings of a united country, Israel was rich, powerful, very respected among the nations of the world. But then after King Solomon, they divided. There was essentially a civil war, and everything went downhill from there. They were conquered by the Assyrians and taken into exile. They were conquered by the Babylonians and taken into exile. And then the Persians came, and they conquered everybody. So they got to come home, but then Alexander the Great came, and he conquered everything he could see. And finally, the Roman Empire, a conquering machine, and they were now, 900 years later, being occupied by the Roman Empire. For almost a millennium, their lives have been marked by conquest, exile, return from exile, more exile, and finally just a disillusionment. And basically, they, they found themselves paralyzed, almost almost like a fossil in amber, unable to move, unable to breathe, no sovereignty, not much of a future. They were a defeated people. One of the commentaries I read said that they were very much in the deep freeze. They were frozen, and they had lost their ability to recognize God's presence among them. They were rather like, I suppose, the salt of the earth. They were still the salt of the earth, the chosen people of God, but they'd lost their flavor. And so they were now no longer good for anything except being trod by the other nations of the world. I'm reminded of an old preacher's story, and I'm grateful to Merrick Zabriskie for reminding me of this years ago. It's a story of a woman who, getting ready for Thanksgiving, she called the Butterball Hotline. Do they still have that? The Butterball Hotline. She had a Butterball turkey, and she was going to cook it. So she called the Butterball Hotline because she had a question. And the question is, our turkey, which is quite a large one, has been frozen. Is it okay to thaw it and then cook it? And the butterball lady said, of course, that's, people do that all the time. In fact, most turkeys come frozen. Just thaw it thoroughly and then put it in the oven and follow the directions. And the woman said, well, ours is a little different. And the woman said, why? And she says, well, it's been frozen for about 28 years. <laughs> and the woman on the butterball line said, 28 years? 
You didn't say, well, it was in the bottom of the freezer and we forgot about it and now we found it and we wondered if it would be okay to cook it. And the woman said, well, I don't really know. I've never dealt with a turkey that's been frozen for 28 years. It may be all right to eat, but it probably won't taste very good after being in the freezer for that long. And I can't be sure that it won't be harmful. And the woman said, well, thank you very much. We're calling. We just wanted to make sure. We've decided to give it to the church. <laughs> that's the famous butterball story. And in a way, the reason I tell you that story is because that's essentially what happened to the people of Israel after the collapse of the kingdom, the kingdom of David and Solomon. They were in the deep freeze for nine centuries. And God, in his mercy, decided to give Israel to the church or to his son for them to be saved. But that doesn't quite explain why it is that, that James and John are so off target in their response to Jesus. Why were they not able to hear what Jesus was saying? Because it was during the exile, during the time of the prophets, when the great expectation for the Messiah first arose. You heard it today in the first reading. The suffering servant, he will bear all of our sins. He will suffer on our behalf. He will be despised among the nations. He will carry to the cross, to his death, the sins of humanity. That's the promised expectation. And somehow that's been altered. The 900 years of exiles and failures and defeats and occupation by foreign powers, the instability and the powerlessness and the impotence of the people of Israel has made them start to look for something else. There grew a desire among the people of Israel, not for a Messiah to come and suffer for them, but somebody who would bring them vengeance, somebody who would recompense for all the pain that they've suffered. And that desire became their hope, their hope of a Messiah who was going to be a strong leader, a military leader, maybe somebody like Judas Maccabeus, who was going to trounce the Romans, throw them out, and reestablish the kingdom of David as it had been. And that hope and that desire became a vision and that vision hardened into an expectation, not a savior, but a deliverer, and somebody who was going to restore the fortunes of King David. So James and John, like all of Israel, were beginning to look for a Messiah that they anticipated rather than the Messiah who came. They were, they were de dealing with their own needs, their own sufferings, their own pains in such a way that they heard what they wanted to hear, they saw what they wanted to see, and what they believed they thought was the truth. But that was not the case. And so what happened is they, they fell into this blindness, this blindness because of their needs, their wants, their desires, their passions. I call it passion interference. When the passions of our lives, when the desires and needs of our lives are so strong that they warp the things that we see, we see things the way we want to see them. Now as it happens, what I call passion interference, and I found this out when I was in seminary, actually has a term, a word, and the word is apathia. It's a Greek word. It's a word not very familiar with us. Apathia literally means to be free from passion freedom from our passions, freedom from our desires, our wants, our needs. That's what apathia is. It's a discipline. It's a spiritual discipline among religious persons. It's that spiritual discipline which calls us away from being enthralled and therefore directed by what it is we think we need. Now, it's a hard thing to explain. I'm a little bit like uh, an old saying in Boston. I grew up in Boston, as you know. And we had a saying there, and the saying is, when a politician doesn't know what to say, he talks. <laughs> well, that's true for us as well, preachers. When preachers don't know what to say, we tell stories, or we use examples. And that's what I'll do now, I'll use an example. And since I'm talking about Boston, let me talk about the Boston Red Sox. I grew up in Massachusetts, and by state law, you have to be a Red Sox fan. And I remember growing up, living and dying with the Boston Red Sox. We used to go to Fenway Park, we used to call it Fenway Pack. 
We'd go there whenever we could from high school. If you got there after the third inning, you could go in for free because so few people were going to Fenway Park. They just let you come in. Those days are way behind us now. But we used to just go in, and I loved all through high school and college. I was a diehard Red Sox fan. And then I finally wound up in Baltimore, Maryland. I was in seminary in Alexandria. But I was living in Baltimore for a while. And there was no Boston Red Sox to go see, so I went to see the Baltimore Orioles. And then something happened. I loved those games. I loved those games and enjoyed them more than I enjoyed the games at Fenway. And I couldn't figure out why that would be. I have no attachment to the Baltimore Orioles, and I have no attachment to the teams they're playing, except when they're playing the Red Sox, which wasn't that often. And so why in the world would I so enjoy the games? And then in seminary, a monk from France who had used to be a, a very, very wealthy, rich uh, art dealer. He had a gallery. He used to buy works of art. He would sell them at a profit. He made tremendous amounts of money. And he received a call and became a monk in the Roman Catholic Church. And he divested himself of all his belongings to be a monk. And he spoke to us at the seminary. He's a fascinating guy. And somebody asked him the question, what was it like when you gave up all, that, all those works of art, all that, all that income, all, that, all those possessions? And he said, I never felt so free. And he found it when he went to look at artworks. All of a sudden, the works of art that he was looking at were not something he thought about maybe buying. He didn't wonder how much they cost. He didn't wonder what they would bring on the open market. He didn't go to a great gallery and look at a, at a masterwork and be upset because he can't buy it and sell it. He began to look at the paintings in themselves, not because of what I can do with them or what they mean to me, but what they mean for themselves. It was as if the painting suddenly came alive. And I began to realize that's what's happened to me with the Baltimore Orioles. Of all things, when I watch the Baltimore Orioles and I'm not rooting for somebody to win, the game is more enjoyable. Because if they get a Grand Slam home run, it's marvelous. Now, when I'm watching the Red Sox, if the other team gets a Grand Slam home run, it's terrible. So when the passions are removed, then there's a sense in which we have a, a, an ability to see the things as they are. And that's what's happened here. Not being freed from the bondage. My, James and John have come before Jesus and not able to see and hear what was truly happening. And so they missed, they missed what Jesus had to offer them. And so Jesus does something fascinating. My fascination with this passage is what Jesus does in response to the outrageous request, in response to the anger of the other 10, in response to their blindness, in response to their inability to find the real meaning of what it means to be the Messiah. He does something marvelous. He calls them. That's what the Bible tells us. Jesus called them and said to them. Now, this is the second time that Jesus has called them. He called them on the Sea of Galilee, on the beach. James, John, Peter, and that other guy, Andrew. <laughs> I, knew, I knew I would think of it. He called them on the Sea of Galilee. And he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Follow me, and you can become proclaimers of my word. This is a second calling. He's saying, follow me, and I will make you servants of other people. I have come not to be served, but to serve. If you follow me in a servant ministry, that's where you will find glory. That's where you will find greatness not sitting side by side with somebody on a throne in a palace, but by following me into the world to do the work of Christ with me. And that's what he's offering them. Now, there's a marvelous moment here because, in a sense, he's helping them to realize that they have an agency in this whole enterprise. Blaise Pascal once said, the great mathematician in France and, and, and philosopher from France, said that God gave us the gift of prayer so that we, his creatures, 
can exercise and recognize the dignity of agency. That's why we pray. We pray so that we can feel ourselves to be agents of God in the world. We don't pray because we have to inform God of what's going on. That's not why we pray. God knows what's going on. We don't have to tell him what's going on. It's not a letter to the editor, to God. We don't pray because we want to tell God how he ought to be doing things. We don't pray because we want God to change his mind, especially if it's to our advantage. We don't pray for those reasons. We pray because God has called us, as he has called the apostles today, and as he called them before at the Sea of Galilee, to become participants with him in the ongoing creation and redemption of the world. We become the instruments of God. We become the agents of God. C.S. Lewis marvelously called it divine abdication. That's one of my favorite expressions from C.S. Lewis. Divine abdication. And what he means by that is that there are many, many things that God could have done himself and could have done them better, and could have done them more efficiently. But he abdicates. He lets us do it. He gives us something to do. He gives us agency in the creation and running of the world. A good example of that is in the, in the temptations of Jesus. Satan says to Jesus, turn these stones into bread. And Jesus answers by saying, we do not live by bread alone, but by the word of God. And but that he means that I can turn the stones into bread and take care of the problem of famine in the world. But by the word of God, you are called to take care of the famine in the world by God's word and by God's call. That's what agency means. And certainly the best example of that would be in the raising of Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus has died. Lazarus was a dear friend of Jesus. Lazarus is in his tomb. And the tomb has been sealed by a great rock that's been rolled over the door. Jesus weeps. And then he resolves to raise Lazarus from the dead. He resolves to do something extraordinary, do something no human being can even think about doing. But first he does something that seems at first puzzling. He tells the people who are standing by, the men who are standing by, to roll the stone away from the door of the tomb. Why in the world does Jesus need, does God need, anyone to roll the stone away? Surely, if his power is so great that he's going to raise summer from the dead, he wouldn't be interfered with by some simple stones. And then it becomes clear. It becomes clear, if we think about it, that God is calling us to be agents and instruments of his salvation of the world for us to roll away the stones. That's our work. God's work is to raise us from the dead. Our work is to roll away the stones that block the light of God, the love of God, the presence of God from coming into our darkened world. And so we roll away the stones of hatred or envy or bitterness or prejudice or gluttony or greed or ever, or ever. there's a million things. There are a million stones that need to be rolled away and that's our work. God will accomplish what God can only accomplish, but we have a role to play, and our task is to roll away those stones. And what James and John were asking for were seats of glory. And what they discovered was that Jesus was giving them a share of glory, the glory of God's own presence, which they could never have imagined. They got what they asked for but just not in the way they asked for well, the way they asked for it so amen I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God,
begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for thy holy Catholic Church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve thee. That thy name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons, especially for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Sean, our presiding bishop-elect, Daniel, our own bishop, and Tommy and Tim, our priests. That they may be faithful witnesses of thy word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. We pray especially for the President of the United States and the Governor of Pennsylvania. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do thy will in all that we undertake that our works may find favor in thy sight. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise thee for the blessed Virgin Mary and all thy saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in thy heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. Hasten, O Father, the coming of thy kingdom, and grant that we, thy servants, who now live by faith, may with joy behold thy Son at his coming in glorious majesty, even Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is me. very meet right and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee O Lord Holy Father Almighty everlasting God the creator of the light and source of life who hast made us in thine image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy and gracious Father, in thine infinite love thou didst make us for thyself. And when we had fallen into sin and became subject to evil and death, thou didst mercifully send Jesus Christ, thine only begotten and eternal Son, to share our humanity, to live and die as one of us, and to reconcile us unto thee, who art the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross, and there made an offering of himself in obedience to thy will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night in which he was betrayed unto suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks unto thee, he brake it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving recalling his blessed death, his mighty resurrection, and glorious ascension, we offer unto thee these gifts. Sanctify them, we beseech thee, by thy Holy Spirit, that they may be for us the body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Do thou likewise sanctify us, thy servants, 
that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve thee in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with the blessed and glorious Virgin Mary and with all thy saints into the joy of thine eternal kingdom. All this we ask through thy Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Hallelujah. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And with thy spirit. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold he that taketh away the sins of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed. body of our Lord Jesus Christ.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us and that we are very members and corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thine everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. And so may God have us always in his holy keeping. May we depart in peace and be kindly affectioned one with another. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, And now may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost rest upon you this day and embrace you forevermore. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ.